Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack. You know who I can do without? I can do without the people in the video store. Which ones? All of them. They never rent quality flicks. They always pick the most intellectually devoid movie on the racks. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Loose Cannon. It has been a while, but I, Alex, the producer, am back with Aaron. How's it going? Hi, I'm, I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm pretty well. This is, We've been wanting to do more recording since... Has it really been like four or five months? It seems like it, yeah. Uh, I, it doesn't... I mean, I've, I've kept busy with Darlene recording, you know, Earth vs. Soup, but... It, and I, I've been doing the main show and that, but it feels like between Michael and I, we were alternating... Uh, workloads during the summer then things came up uh, health-wise for both of us and it Mm -hmm. was like you know what we wanted to get back to recording we kept saying we were doing we kept in in constant contact with you but we just never got around to doing it now as we're winding down for the year I I said you know what we really have to start recording a few more episodes there's some neat stuff that's come in not necessarily good stuff no but neat (laughs) stuff that's but stuff (laughs) that's coming stuff has come in yeah yeah. stuff has definitely come in so uh, I, I guess obviously you said you've been recording stuff with Darlene. Uh, what else have you been up to as far as uh, this goes? You're you're back doing the re- reenacting stuff. Yeah, right? reenacting, but reenacting season is over for the year. Um, probably won't. It's too cold, right? Yeah, well, too cold. you'd think that, but there there are events that go on during the winter because Eastern Front, you know, um, that's oh, kind yeah. of a thing. And our uniforms are pretty warm, just as as they are without even winter gear. So theoretically, we could do we could go out and do events with the stuff that we have. Um, But we that's a lot of driving in the cold. Yeah, we we generally draw a line at like, you know, after October. No, we really don't want to do anything until spring. Um, But yeah, we have good gear for it. Darlene even has a nice over like a like an officer's jacket that she has that is really, really thick wool. So she says it's too hot to wear in normal winters uh, around here, usually. Well, then you should come up here, wait till it's like, you know, minus, I don't know, 20 or so Celsius and you'll be fine. Yeah, no, then then she'd be okay with wearing that. But uh... <laughs> I had my window open a sliver last night because uh, my apartment gets pretty warm. It's got an old boiler room heater, so it's, you know, we don't get to control the heat. Mm-hmm. And I woke up like an icicle. I'm like, what is going on? Uh, it's because we had like 80 mile winds, 80 miles per hour winds, and it was blowing like every, it was like Jack Frost coming inside of here. Yeah, so yeah. it took like five hours for the apartment to heat back up again. Wow. <laughs> so believe me, and, and we're not even really starting winter yet. <laughs> no, yeah, it's just December, right? So it's, you know, we, we have much of the same weather here in michigan that, that then you do oh, like yeah those... oh absolutely it's you know the great lakes winners yeah exactly <laughs> for sure exactly were, were you part of that uh that giant vortex that happened in upstate new york or, or did you get away from that we didn't get a lot from it but i mean like last last night when you were you were talking about the wind we we had that wind too it was okay it was pretty but not crazy no no four or five feet of snow so that you might be saved from that at least until february yeah yeah it's and and plus we're far enough away from the lakes that we don't get lake effect very often it now and then it will happen but usually it's from lake huron when the wind's coming out of the northeast but where i grew up like right on lake michigan we we used to routinely get like three feet of lake effect snow in an event and then yeah, it, I remember huge amounts of snow. But yeah, so I, what a better time to... You know, actually, there really isn't a better time to watch movies. Not necessarily good movies, but movies. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> to that end, we have a couple of movies that are recently released from uh, Kino Lorber Films. And uh, one of them is Stunt Rock, uh, brought to us by Kino Lorber's studio Classics. Now, I say classics in in quotes because that, that is the name of of the studio, but uh, I don't know how much of a classic this film is. It was interesting yeah, from, for, to a standpoint. Uh, for anybody that uh, doesn't know what Stunt Rock is, it is a 90-minute uh, demo reel to showcase uh, what 1970s-style stunts were and 
I guess, B level or C level glam rockers. Yeah, it's it's strange. And here's the thing: like, it, it showcases a guy named Grant Page, who is a stunt guy out of Australia. And I kept thinking all the way through this: this stunt guy is obviously very talented. Very, oh, oh, absolutely. This is all incredibly dangerous stuff at the time because you know safety wasn't as rigorous as it is today some of it didn't have any safety protocols in place the stuff that they were showing that was filmed in australia yeah would not fly in america even then yeah no it was it was insanity and i kept thinking boy i just i I, this guy had to have worked on mad max i want to see these like flashbacks to other stunt movies that they keep doing um i want to see mad max i want to follow the stunt guys through mad max and it turns out yeah he was a stunt guy on mad max (laughs) Well, because how how many stunt guys were there in Australia at the time, right? Yeah. (laughs) Probably probably not a ton. Yet, like, the the basic plot, we're not going to go, there's not really much to it, but the basic plot is a real-life stuntman decides he wants to make a movie about being a stuntman, how cool it is, and also mix it with rock and roll because that's cool. So the movie is a stuntman from Australia moves to America meets up with his cousin's band where they show a bunch of concerts for reasons. Yeah. Uh, as And a journalist follows him around to see what it's like to be a stuntman and why it's cool, but also dangerous and crazy. Mm-hmm. That's the movie. Yeah. there. It's a very, very loose plot. It's, it's just a, it's a very thin framework to hold up scenes in the movie that they thought would be really cool. Like it's listed as a mockumentary, but a mockumentary in the sense of like before Spinal Tap really gave that that genre form. Yeah, and it's not really a mockumentary because it's not meant to be funny. It's it's meant to be a showcase of this guy's stunt creds, really, and 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 to glamorize it as if it like as if it's like the coolest job in the world. I mean, yeah, it, it's pretty cool, but from our eyes, you know, our modern eyes, a lot of this stuff is old hat. Like we understand how it works. Yes. It's incredibly dangerous, but it doesn't stand out to us. It's almost like uh, interesting how like nowadays the stunts are more elaborate. They look more dangerous than ever. And we're not even talking like CG, like the stunts in the late eighties into the late nineties, and even in the early 2000s, before CG took over everything, yeah, uh, uh, were like the most amazing, death-defying looking stunts. But they were extremely safe, yeah. like to the point where like the, the they had you know people on on their mathematicians to figure out the physics and everything to know exactly what was going to happen and and be as safe as possible. This stuff looks easy, but is way more dangerous. Yeah. Than what, what happened you know decade later and it's just because it it does look easy like there's nothing to it hey i'm gonna set myself on fire and then fire myself with a slingshot into the into the ocean or whatever yeah and and we're not talking really with like a proper fire suit or like they basically put you know a thick coat on them (laughs) yeah it's it's pretty crazy when you're watching it and you got to give the guy credit for that and and those are the parts of the movie where i thought the movie was actually interesting watch him do these insanely simple but dangerous stunts the biggest ones to me were where he's driving his little dune buggy without a helmet on and you have the over the shoulder cam yeah to see how how dangerous it really is and also simple things like like hanging on top of a car getting out of a car and, and going on top of it or hanging out of a window on a highway and you know, at first glance, you know, we're so jaded by what we've seen. We're like, oh, big deal. Until you watch like the documentary style crew filming them, filming them film it. Mm-hmm. And you realize that they weren't speeding it up. They were actually going 55 or 60 miles per hour. Yeah. With, no, with like, no restraints or anything yeah, like there, that. There's, there, there's no harness. No, no restraint. Uh, some of it looked like it was filmed. It wasn't on a closed circuit. They're just out there on the real highway. Mm-hmm and going you know 100 kilometers per hour whereas when you watch uh, a modern movie they'll make it look like they're going that speed Mm -hmm. but they're actually only going like 10 or 20 miles per hour uh and but and what you how you could tell was uh 
when you're looking at the road and you see how fast the uh, the median and the, the drawn lines are, are going mm-hmm. in your in the passing lane, and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, that's going at the, that's going at like normal speed when you're watching like the news and they're showing a race or something. Yeah, and 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 the way that their hair is flying in the wind and everything, it if you watch a, a modern movie, their hair won't be moving fast enough, or it'll move too fast if they sped it up, and it's like. Oh, he, like, and it's it's really dangerous stuff. And it didn't seem like he was doing it for any reason other than to be a daredevil. Yeah, he was just doing it for fun. And I guess to get his name out there. And I, I respect that. I do. Um, it just it's put into a framework that's so kind of nebulous, let's say. And I guess I'm probably not the audience for the other large part of this movie, which are <laughs> glam rock concerts. Wait, the band sounds like they want to be deep purple. Very much so. Like, like if you've heard like smoke on the water or, yeah. or any of that, that era of deep purple, late sixties, early seventies, they sound like that. And then they look, they look like they saw, uh a, a early genesis or uh or like uh david bowie concert from the early 70s and went we want to be that but also dungeons and dragons yeah but we also but, but we have the budget of community theater <laughs> it's it's like a weird combination of they 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 saw sword in the stone and like yeah we want to have merlin in it we want to have merlin in our band yeah 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 but we also want to have satan but we also want to have like guys in really want... tight spandex, like gimp masks, and the the gimp, ma- and we want to use a modulator to make the voice sound different because we we would want to make them mysterious. Yeah, and like people in weird, yeah, David Bowie esque jumpsuits, and every every single one of them, like I I know this is the era before MTV, but there wasn't a good looking person at all in the band at all, like remotely. It looked like in, uh, in Wayne's world when they go uh, backstage and Wayne and Garth look around and everybody's <laughs> ugly that yeah. was left behind. That... <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to be mean. It's just, I was just like, wow. Like usually a band has one good looking person in it. And no. And the, the one dude looked like he had a lion's mane hair with two toned, not frosted tips. It's like frosted sides to a giant permed long hair. Wasn't wasn't that the guy that played the devil or something like that in the band? He, he like shot so. fire out of his hands at some point. Yeah, the Prince of Darkness. I think that's what they refer to him as. <laughs> yes, and the, the person that has the like sex dungeon gimp mask, but it's not. It's made out of like cotton. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. It's <laughs> I think that was the keyboard player. <laughs> It's something. This is something. Um, and the, the and the singing, like it was, what blew my blew my mind was it wasn't recorded well. No, like all their concerts, like the rest of the movie, the sound production. It's a mono. It would have been originally a mono sound production. It sounds okay, but all of the audio recordings are blown out, like they're overproduced and they they crank the gain too high on it. Well, and, uh, and I think there's like a big division plot wise i'm sorry for like continuing going back to the plot frame oh like, absolutely it, it seems shoehorned in yeah the the band if you want to make a movie about this band this glam rock band awesome great how are you connecting it to the stunt guy like there's one time they talk about maybe doing some more stunts in their show but they don't and so uh, the two parts of the movie are completely disconnected from each other. They're connected with with the stunt guy apparently being cousins with the lead singer yeah that, that, that's it that's it uh, and they mention it two or three times. Yeah, you're my cousin. Oh, uh-huh. maybe I, I should learn a thing or two about stunts. Maybe I should learn a thing or two about music. <laughs> and they laugh and they walk away. Mm-hmm. And the only other time that they're connected is they go to a party together. Yeah, and I think they're up on the roof one time where um, the lead woman in this movie that he's making decides to actually like grapple down the side of the building. Yes. And, and she's a, a semi-famous uh, Dutch actress. Yeah, Monique who did, uh, Van de Ven. And she had done... I, I I recognized maybe one or two of the later movies she had made, that you know, but not things that I had ever personally seen, but I recognized the poster slash cover of them. Sure. Yeah, I, I can't say that I'm familiar with 
with any of her work. Uh, and and outside of that, there's not really any professional actors in this. Yeah, and, and credit credit again where it's due, right? They they did what they wanted to do with this oh, film. Now I know where she's she was in Turkish Delight. She was in a, a, a Paul Verhoeven film. Oh, uh, okay. Back in early in his career, so that's where I saw. I, I I hadn't seen the movie, but I saw the poster. That's why. But yeah, like there's there's not really anybody else. I mean, there it is. And very interesting premise in the fact that this is from an era where you could greenlight a movie like this. It was an international production, uh, obviously Australia, America, but it's right before the corporate takeover of all of the movie theaters where you couldn't, like back in the 70s, you could just make a movie and random independent theaters would show it, right? Sure. And they probably uh, they probably showed this in Australia as well, like where... It was probably a much bigger hit there. Well, I mean, I'm I'm looking at its its global box office returns, and it made less than ten thousand dollars. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then maybe not. Uh, I this might be one of those movies where they made it, and then it was a tax write off eventually, and then uh, I get the feeling it was probably lost for a while before getting uh, unearthed. Yeah, and and and. Even if it grossed less than ten thousand dollars, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. No, it's not no great. That's the, that's the thing. The stunts, some of them feel a little out of place. Uh, some of them are great, but they they did pad out the time a little bit by showing stunts from previous films, oh. better movies, and and in multiple multiple versions of it on the screen. Like they just duplicated the uh, or mirrored the footage because it was in a different format. So instead of blowing it up to whatever they were using to make the movie, like let's say it was 16 millimeter and they have eight millimeter footage, they just doubled it on the screen. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, so I'm seeing two cars exploding. Okay, the same car, but great. Thanks. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I'll say this. It's not, not generally a good idea in your low budget movie that isn't that great to reference how great other movies are that are better than yours yes and showing footage from like gone in 60 seconds the old gone in 60 seconds like there's a large sequence maybe two minutes long where they do that uh and then they reference a couple of movies that uh that oh which is what's his name here the stuntman i am drawing a... it's what what grant pa- grant page yeah grant page uh that that he was in uh the previous one uh that the same director had made right before this with him so it's like I get they're they're kind of cross referencing and promoting their previous film, mm-hmm. but I uh, it I I guess this was at a time well considering that right around here I believe is when it's just before or around the same time that uh, Steve McQueen passed away and he was sort of known as being the first Hollywood actor that did his own stunts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this was sort of in the rise of of when stuntmen could be popular or could get known and he was probably going to be the the first he wanted to be the first stunt guy that was known for that he was clearly not a great actor yeah <laughs> uh but i mean he, he couldn't have been much worse than like a steven seagal <laughs> right so you yeah. know had things turned out differently he might have been able to do uh more with his career but he was already a fair bit older at this time sure well, I mean, when, I think, when, when, I think, I think it was, he was around 40 when this movie was made. When was Evil Knievel like really popular though? He was, that was like the late sixties where he really started up. Yeah. Wasn't it like, yeah. Like late sixties to early seventies. Yeah. Early seventies. So I'm, I'm trying so that to was, find, you know, like, dare, that was the daredevil. Era. Yeah. So I guess the daredevil stuff there uh, that coincided with uh, Steve McQueen doing bullet where he did all his own stunts, stunt driving in that. And I think, I would say probably the first time that we heard about like a big film actor doing all of his own stunts would have been Steve McQueen in like the great escape mm-hmm. in the early sixties. Okay. Uh, Cause that, that motorcycle jump he does and that stuff that was all him. Mm-hmm. And I know that caused a bit of a stir at the time because they were like, Oh, we can't have that. We can't have you getting hurt. Uh, otherwise it'll ruin your career, ruin our movie and yada, yada. And then, Prior to that, I think a lot of people in America and, and the world thought that the actors did all their own stunts. Yeah. U- until it sort of made news headlines that it's like, oh, he's getting in trouble because he does his own stunts. And everybody's like, well, doesn't everybody? Like, they didn't know. Nobody had the eye to look for a stunt double. 
Yeah. And uh, so you, you've got him, and I'm trying to think of anybody else. Oh, um, uh, Kirk Douglas did a lot of his own too. Uh, so there were only a handful of people that did that. So this, you know, he he saw an opportunity and tried to to grasp it. Uh, it has a very very 70s feel for oh, sure. Like I mean, yeah. it's 1978, but like you were mentioned to me that you could like you could uh, see and smell the the old spice in it. Yeah, yeah. It was like I can smell body odor and old spice through the tel- yeah. through the computer screen like, because like everyone's I, I was wearing wa- like thick leather at some point and like no t-shirt underneath it's just bare chested and leather jacket and I'm like, like i was oh. looking at like oh. i was looking i'm like okay i can smell the nicotine and i can smell the aqua velva yeah and and like after all these stunt guys are getting hurt i'm like okay i can smell the bengay i can smell all the <laughs> you can you can it oozed 70s uh the, the raw 70s feel yeah it did uh it, it, it did for sure uh now as far as you know it sort of just ends uh, <laughs> there really is the, yeah. this is a movie without an arc yeah there really isn't any arc it's just it's a sequence of events but there isn't really an it's it is something that's interesting to watch i i would if you're at all interested in stunt work especially in the pre-modern era where it's all homogenized and safe and if you're interested in like the daredevil type stuff it may yeah. be worth a watch or if you're uh, into glam rock do it yeah that's the thing the rock isn't particularly bad it just doesn't stand out mm-hmm. other than it being like a time capsule of of kmart bands <laughs> sure yeah uh, now the the Blu-ray itself has uh, audio commentary and and it has some interviews with some of the people that worked on it, but you know that would be interesting probably from a technical standpoint. I don't think that this is going to be something unless you're like a big B movie collector that you're going to ne- need to necessarily buy. Uh, but in my mind, it was worth at least checking out once to see some some of the crazy stunts that you could never get away with nowadays because not just insurance purposes. I feel like. <laughs> A lot of the stuff that they captured on film, they're lucky they captured it without somebody getting seriously hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, like, when I was watching the movie, let me see if I can find my notes. Um, They, like, referenced a couple things that I thought were interesting, just from, like, a personal standpoint. They, when uh, one of the stunts that they're doing uh, right at the beginning of the film was shooting him with, like, uh, a gun as he's falling off, like, a water tower. And the squibs don't fire properly. Okay. That, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's interesting. And he goes, no, fine. I'll give you more blood. And he, he like re-rigs himself and they go up. And then the actress pulls out a Tommy gun and starts just opening up on him. And uh, he, you know, all the all the squibs fire. He falls into it. And she goes, is that is that fine? Yeah, it's no St. Valentine's Day massacre, but it'll work. I'm like, oh man, come on! <laughs> it's, it's... Or and the the actor play, or yeah, the actor that was playing the her agent, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. And he made what is his line earlier? The 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 reporter asks says to him, uh, I, I think something about. Uh, he mentions to them that, that that oh, stuntmen are a dime a dozen. They don't matter. They they all they do want to do is is uh, that they. They just want, they do it for the thrill. They want to, they want to impress. They don't care if they get hurt. It's great because if they get hurt or, or die, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I still get paid. I still get paid. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you jerk. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, that's the line that sticks out in the movie. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, and uh, like when they go to that party and there's just, it's a party, but it's like a magic trick party where it's just a bunch of magicians doing weird, like, escape attempts and yeah uh, uh, they chain the one guy down at the bottom of the pool or something and he has to escape there's the the other magician that is doing the handkerchief tricks it's like this this, what what kind of party is i don't i don't get this (laughs) this this is the craziest party as in like it was all these people doing tricks but it looks so boring (laughs) yeah that part was, yeah, that part definitely was. I, I don't know. It the trailer makes it seem like it's nonstop insanity with like wizards and 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 you know explosions and 
It's about thirty minutes of interesting footage. Yeah, and then they and then they made a ninety minute movie around it. Yeah, that that that's it. I don't want to like really crap on the movie because I mean it, no, it doesn't it, deserve it, that. But it's I I always like watching something unique like this because yeah. there's not anything else like it, and there probably never will be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is unique to be sure. To be sure. Now moving on from that to a film that is supposed to be, at least how it was advertised more exciting and better than star wars more exciting and better than alien more exciting and better than uh, uh et or raiders of the lost ark or uh what was it close encounters is what it was advertised mm-hmm. this is supposed to be taking you into another dimension and that is treasure of the four crowns my god super, it's originally in supervision 3d yeah uh, oh my god this movie uh <laughs> this this is uh not a spaghetti western it's a spaghetti adventure film or is it spaghetti sci-fi I, it's it's spaghetti it's something. something yeah it's something um i i it's it's the one thing that stood out to me was spending the first 25 minutes with no dialogue yeah, I I went back after you said that, and I I looked at the counter. Uh, it was like twenty two minutes and like thirteen seconds before a single word is spoken. And th- in that entire time, you don't know what the hell's going on. The, so, uh, I'll give a brief background on the film. It was the last starring feature of Tony Anthony, who was uh, an American actor, American Italian actor, who was known for making spaghetti westerns. Uh, just not like basically when Eastwood stopped making spaghetti westerns and, and actually got famous back in America, this guy sort of took over that uh, that spaghetti western American role of the late sixties into the early seventies. Did a, a, a slew of them, sure, and they're they're the ones that we wouldn't have necessarily gone out and purchased. But if you ever buy like a box set of spaghetti westerns, you know, in a cheap bargain bin. Mm-hmm you're bound to have one or two of his films and they'll be technically more, they'll be superior to the ones that are just pure Italian movies with Italians in them because uh, he'll actually dub his own voice into it. He's actually a decent enough actor when given the right role and given the right uh, stuff. Like he's got one of those faces where you look at him, you're like, have I seen you before? And it's probably because he looks a lot like Robert Blake. <laughs> yeah. And I, that's probably what it is. Cause I thought I've seen him in many, many movies. And then I looked at his acting credits and I'm, and I didn't really see anything that stood out. He, he's Robert Blake with John Travolta hair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, like you can see, he could be a good actor if he wasn't given crazy, ridiculous script and directions. Sure. Uh, and this movie came out in 1983 and they were, like quite serious almost all the advertisement was trying to compare it to and make it better than Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, wow. Well, you know, if if you're trying to go for that, you need to actually have a plot. Yes, yeah, so it, this was filmed in 3D uh and at the time uh interestingly enough, it was filmed in a process that is a little closer to the way that they film 3D films now where you have your left and right and it's full color. They had polarized glasses to watch it like we use now when you go to a, a modern 3D mm-hmm. film, uh, and then it was also released in uh, in Europe, like in markets that didn't have the technology to view that. It was released in the anaglyph uh, uh, red blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this Blu-ray has three versions. It has the modern the modern um, 3D. The anaglyph 3D comes with a, a pair of glasses. Uh, it would have been nice if it came with two. I personally I, I prefer it when they come with two because you're not usually watching a 3D movie by yourself. Um, and then it has the 2D version which is uh, what we did because I don't have a 3d TV and I did not want to watch an anaglyph movie if I can get away with it. Cause it just it hurts my eyes after a while of wearing those kind of glasses. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this was his last starring feature. It made no money <laughs> uh, yet. I went online looking around and there's a lot of comments on trailers and clips from the movie of people saying they had a ton of fun seeing it as a young little kid. Oh, sure. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, at, at, or even people that were teenagers that said that they went and saw it a couple of times at their local like grindhouse theater because to them it was the most hilarious thing ever especially if they uh uh smoked a little pot before going in <laughs> yeah the, the the one thing i can i can say for sure with this is this movie celebrates you not paying attention if you are just watching it kind of vaguely in like in the corner of your eye or whatever every time you 
get jerked back to the screen. It's because something really cool is happening on screen. There isn't really yeah. reason for it. I, I have a drinking uh, a, a drinking game for you. Okay. Now you might you might die. Yeah. So just be prepared. Uh, go in. You know, have have some bread handy. Have don't go in with an empty stomach. Uh, drink every time they repeat the same 3D shot more than once. Oh God, yeah, that's that's got to be like a whole fifth of vodka at least, right there. <laughs> Boom. You'll go through like 40 ounces in no time because they repeat. Let's say like a, an arrow comes towards the screen. Oh yeah, they'll they'll repeat that same, and I mean the exact same shot. Yes, two or three times in a row, and then in about three minutes they'll put the same one from a different angle. Yes, I even wrote down in my notes they are Hawk the Slayer firing the rapid fire crossbow. I don't know if you've ever seen Hawk the Slayer. I have not. That is an amazing film. How like awful it is. It's actually really fun to watch. But this was like it, it felt like it was. I don't know if this was made after Hawk the Slayer or not. I can't I, I can't remember. But it felt like especially the crossbow was just right from Hawk the Slayer, this rapid fire crossbow where they're repeating the footage over and over and over again. Well, well, this is uh, this is one of the most egregious uses of, of European 3D I can ever think of where it's like slow. every single thing has to be dangling in front of the screen or dropped in front of the screen or uh repeated over and over again and like i said it opens up with no explanation of what this movie is it just has the the titles come up and it's tony anthony very slowly going through some european castle uh with no explanation as to why he's there what he's doing there it's raiders of the lost ark style but yet he seems bored while he's doing it yeah and he's wearing like a red michael jackson jacket yeah and, and everywhere he goes like rickety uh fences are closing behind him uh i laughed when you know instead of bats flying at him it was pterodactyls mini pterodactyls mini pterodactyls with very very visible fishing line holding them up oh every single thing that floats in this you can see the string yeah it's, <laughs> it's not, it's, it wasn't even that. fishing line it was it was like pipe cleaner almost yeah, it was so thick. there's a couple of them where it does look like it's sewing thread rather than fishing line honestly that's the, oh look like it was the, the ones that were like jerky and falling falling apart but it everything attacks him and it looks so fake and he, he has to do the whole like ed wood thing where he's grabbing onto it and pretending it's attacking him mm-hmm. uh then the dogs attack him which are supposed to be like hellhounds but they're just dogs they're like regular dogs and i felt sorry because it looked like he was trying to throw the dogs around and they're just like we want to play yeah i mean there's like the the big boa constrictor that 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 comes down on him at one point and i felt bad for the boa constrictor because you know (laughs) they they clearly just dropped it on him yeah there's like these um condors that are in it as well and you can tell that they've been brought in by an animal handler and they're just being thrown at the camera (laughs) <laughs> yeah. all the animal stuff in this beginning was just like it it, it made me shake my head the first tw- uh, first 10 minutes are almost completely silent except for him crawling through little nooks and crannies and weird uh traps trying to get him uh, before he finds this key that's supposed to unlock the four crowns which We'll get into later, but never ever actually gets explained what they are. Uh, yeah, not not adequately and, at the very least. And this haunted castle, which is just it's haunted, but easily seen. It's not hidden from anybody, so anybody could have just been going there. Uh, and like the skeletons and everything are laughing at him, and and there's ghosts coming to life trying to get him. But it's not explaining whether they're trying to protect the treasure or if they're just trying to torment him for no reason. Uh, yeah. Mm. lots of laughter and and weird mischievous uh ghosts that are firing crossbows at him over and over and over again uh there's that spinning sort of spiky thing that goes over top of the the sarcophagus yeah and he seems was... very unconcerned when it's going like that like he's just laying next to a corpse covered in jewels and just sort of mildly staring at this death trap that's spinning above him and then the flaming balls that are supposed to be like the giant boulders from Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's what a lot of people compared it to Mm -hmm. come at them. And you're like, Oh, it must be huge. And then as it comes into the perspective, you realize it's only about four feet tall. Yeah. Like bowling balls. (laughs) And it's made, 
yeah Ray, Ray talked to, and realized it's almost like paper mache it's not even like supposed to be i thought oh maybe it's like an iron ball it's on fire no no because when it rolls it starts to bounce off the ground <laughs> yeah and he's like oh and he makes a funny face as he runs away from it <laughs> and he dives through the window like everything's solved by just jumping through windows and then explosions happen but he falls to the ground like a big explosion happened before the explosion happens <laughs> yeah well they, and okay the, fair enough he's trying to take cover from any shrapnel that's coming at him i don't know but, and the big explosion happens about 30 feet in front of the castle but we're meant to to believe that the castle exploded sure yeah whatever <laughs> and, and, and then it cuts fast forward and he's getting into a, a car with i guess his friend who put him up to the job employer and, or something yeah. employer yeah and he, and he and the first lines are, are uttered basically that he's saying that you never you know you never told me that there was going to be haunted castles or whatever and he's like yes i did oh but i just and don't believe like, in the supernatural you know yeah yeah exactly and uh, okay and then he's hired by some institute i don't know did they ever explain what the institute was it's the same it's the same group that hired him for for this last job really it's that yeah they and they, they, they want him to recover the four crowns because contr- having control of the four crowns will controls the universe somehow yeah uh, and, and, and will lead lead humanity into the future of greatness and control of the universe and some guy who started a cult in a in like a bookstore uh has control of the crowns but instead of taking over the world he's using them or d- directly taking over the world and the universe he's using them to expand his religious cult and make uh, 400 million dollars a year off of tithing yeah it's he just wants to like have cultists to abuse basically that's that's his goal and I, or that's that's what that's what they say <laughs> and i swear that they said that his his castle that he had built was in las vegas and i was i'm like oh my god this is gonna be like oceans 11 meets you know yeah and, and, I, I, but i'm sure they didn't say lost las vegas i, I probably that, misheard that, that 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 he's 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 uh abusing his powers or he's, he's abusing christianity yet it's clear like he's supposed to be an offshoot of christianity yet he's dressed like some he looks like something right out of conan the barbarian Dude, he's dressed like he's coming out of zardos yeah and he has uh his all of his follower minions wear like pig masks yeah because they're <laughs> swine yeah 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 <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it just it, it's so weird and they don't really do well to explain anything that's going on and then you go into like a five minute sequence of weird 3D shots where you're repeating everything. And then you have like uh, Anna o- Obregan, who plays Liz in this, like scream at the camera in slow motion oh. as sparks fall past her. Yeah, for no reason. And like it, it's every shot seemed out of place. Yeah. <laughs> and they go, OK, then they're going to do their Ocean's Eleven stuff they're going to break in still not explaining what the crowns are oh and they totally uh, ignore all the problems that they would have had getting into the castle they they describe at length all the security measures that are in this castle like the roof has pressure sensors that feathers will set off so i'm like man birds constantly set off the freaking alarms and then and to get oh oh and when they open up their their uh briefcase that has their high technology that's going to break in it's two pieces. One of them ends up being like a Lego piece that slots into the building and uses some sort of uh, what appears to be like a battery tester multimeter to to deactivate the door. Yeah, they just they just happen to have the exact shaped thing that would fit. And the other piece uh, was supposed to be some sort of other high tech cracking tool but i looked at it it's i believe it's actually a uh a uh vocal or guitar effects pedal it it might be i think the doors they they said that they could be opened by a tune like somebody had to whistle a tune so that's that's why it was making weird sounds but it literally that that other piece there was like a a vocal or something like that for for like it it was like an analog effects pedal yeah and they didn't even bother to change the name 
<laughs> they just they just put it in there as if it was like some high piece of safe cracking technology, uh, and they break in. Uh, and th- this this is weird because it moves awfully quick. Like there's not a lot of peril uh, up to this point, and then it turns into uh, like Mission Impossible with them having to get ar- around some of these uh, these traps by clinging to the ceiling and and we lead into the final act which is them approaching the throne room or the the crown room and the key opens up the crowns to get these magical orbs like these like like something that's like the the infinity gauntlet stones or something yeah. from marvel and, and touching them possesses tony anthony mm-hmm. and gives him the power ultimate but also makes him evil like these are supposed to be like the most powerful stones like that, that are going to shape humanity and they're 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 going to be used for the good of mankind he touches them and turns into a demon mm-hmm. and his head spins around really fast cartoonishly almost like in a trauma film like toxic avenger like spin 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 looks really fake and then he like shoots fire out of his hands and and there's like crazy cosmic like radiation effects that burn all of the henchmen mm-hmm. uh he shoots like concentrated laser beams at uh at the the main uh cult leader mm-hmm. that this movie was rated pg by the way yeah that, and it, no, and it was pg movie. all the way through no with that cuts <laughs> off cuts off layers of his flesh revealing gore underneath and eventually his face gets sliced off starts to melt his eyes melt out of his face and explode he burns to death screaming uh he, most of the the good guys in quotes that were on his team also die uh the female sort of love interest begs him not to kill her all the while tony anthony has now had his face mutated into some grotesque demon mm-hmm. that is oozing pus and and blood out of his his face mutation bumps and he's like laughing uncontrollably as like a villain and then he just stops puts the stones into his pocket tells her it's going to be all okay uh they leave they say we we've got the stone we've got the the crowns and that's the end of the movie yeah it's it just sort of the movie sort of happens and then sort of ends and then it, it, it like at the very end there's some swamp monster that comes to the surface and and a chicken's head flies out towards the screen <laughs> i don't i don't get this movie i i mean it's it's clearly all meant to just showcase 3d special effects and you know okay fair enough but those sort of movies were being done in the 50s and 60s you don't need to be doing this in 1983 or whatever and the movies that were showcasing 3D stuff back in the 50s and 60s had a more coherent plot. Remember, this is better than Star Wars. Yeah. Better than Raiders, according to the trailer. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're trying to promote your film. That Fair enough. But you can't be making those kinds of claims. And I mean, what I ended up liking about it was when they did the 3D... I love... Uh, like exploding like i i love it when you see like fireworks in old uh film so i like the idea of the exploding effects ha- being like somebody pointing a roman candle towards the camera and having it fly towards you yeah so i really like the sparkly magical effects which was like fireworks and sparkles and then rocks and debris flying towards you in the first person perspective because it's not something you're really ever going to see in real life unless you're getting hurt. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody yeah. was actually pointing it at, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so seeing them do that, I was like, yes, I, I love that analog effect of, you know, of that being there. Also, I am a sucker for uh, like synth and like Moog analog synth. Oh, yeah. They have yeah. That sort of effects like the, you know, the, the, the spacey lasery sounding uh, synthesizer. All the animals, all the animals were, they didn't even use proper animal sounds. They just used a, a Moog synthesizer. Yeah. Uh, and then the best part of the movie overall was Ennio Morricone uh, being brought in to do the score because he's he's like the most famous Italian uh, composer for films ever, right? So mm-hmm. good, the bad, and the ugly, and everything. So it was weird. A list, triple uh, A budget level score that doesn't match the visuals of the movie. <laughs> yeah, 
it was almost like it didn't even feel like he made the score for this movie even though he might have it almost feels like he made a score and then they fit it to the movie that that's really possible because i did notice the the quality of the music i thought it was pretty darn good but it often didn't seem to fit perfectly the scenes like it 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 almost would have fit like it it almost felt like the score for dune yeah like a jardarovsky's dune or or whatever like something strange and i don't know like yeah there's parts of this movie that i i found really fascinating like they clearly put a lot of effort into getting props for this movie for like all the suits of armor that are always around and there's a lot of good set dressing yeah it's just it, it just wasn't utilize the way you would have expected it it feels very much like an italian or spanish movie even though it's a co-production and, and uh tony anthony produced it partially himself yeah uh, I, I guess it, it was filmed a lot in spain as well that that could be yeah, something with that the and probably using uh, you know italian and spanish crews to do mm-hmm. it on the cheap now i think what is kind of weird with this is all of the actors are speaking english the mouth mouths all moved to english but they filmed it like a lot of Japanese movies, Chinese movies, and uh, Italian and European movies did back then, which was uh, record it all live, but then they would completely overdub the entire film. Okay. Because because they couldn't soundproof anything, uh, and they, they didn't have high quality enough uh, microphones to work in the field. So all of the actors, ADR dubbed all of their lines over top of their own voices. Uh, over top of the own footage because you can tell like if you put headphones on and listen I'm like oh that's coming from a booth mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so it, it's kind of jarring a little bit because it is all these actors real voices and it is happening over top of their real performances but there's a disparity in that they could be like 20 feet away mm-hmm. but the voices will sound like they're two feet away because they recorded at the booth yeah, you know, I guess I didn't notice that at all because I'm I'm really used to it with a lot of the the older films that. Well, yeah, watched. they used to do that in Hollywood and all the B movie Corman movies are always like that. Yeah, so I, I guess it just didn't stand out to me. So I'm used to it. I'm not gonna. I guess I can't say it's so, a big deal to me. That plus taking that sort of sound recording style plus the sound effects for like all the synth sound effects, mixing that with the very sort of soft shooting like everything had almost like a dreamlike sense to it a lot of the scenes had that softer halo effect on things it it did give it a, a unique it almost felt like a 70s movie even though it came out in the 80s yes like a mid 70s italian movie like like had this been a movie that came out before raiders and before star wars it had this been like 1975 mm-hmm I think it, even though it was ridiculous, I think people, more people would have been talking about it for the adventure of it. Yes. It, but it, it had the misfortune of coming out about seven years too late. Mm-hmm. I, I, I agree. Like, like I said, it's, it's a movie that it rewards you barely paying attention. So you're not like really listening to the dialogue because the dialogue doesn't really mean anything in this movie. It's there to just propel you from adventure scene to adventure scene. So every time you look back at the screen, there's something interesting happening on screen. Whether it be overacting or ridiculous effects. Yeah. You know what? I think hurts this even more than Raiders and that you could have had that as a one-off is that a similar aesthetic to this. If you take away the modern stuff, like if you look at the cult and everything, this came out like two years after Conan the Barbarian. Yeah. And you, you watch Conan the Barbarian, and you're like, whoa. And, and that was a low-budget affair. Mm-hmm. But you look at that, and you're like, wow, the costuming and all, and the special effects are, are much better, but they're similar. Mm-hmm. No, I but agreed. Th- this was this was kind of weird. It's like it had all the special effects style, like the Italian special effects style that you would see in something like a Beastmaster, but tried to mix it with Ocean's Eleven. And I, I recommend watching Hawk the Slayer. Alex, you, you, you got to watch I'm, it. Just, I'm going to. I'm going to write it down on my list it, of things because it, it came out. To. It came out in 1980, so before this movie, and it, it it's arguably a better quality film, um, both from like a filmmaking perspective. Like, yeah, there's some soft focus stuff in it. There's some weird like repeating 3D ish effects in it, even though it wasn't in 3D. Um, but it's it actually has a plot, 
as weird as it is, but there is a plot. <laughs> and it has Jack Palance in it. Oh, well, that's good. But yeah, like this is going to be. Uh, this is one for. The, I won't forget this movie. No, I'll tell no, you that. Absolutely not. Like, no, like, like, there, there's a lot of really low budget, forgettable adventure films from this era. I don't. There's certain scenes I will never forget from this. And I do think this one, if you've got a group of friends around, you're having a couple of brewskis, this could be a really fun watch. To pair it up with another ridiculous film from the era. Just know that, like, that first 20 minutes of having complete silence, other than, like, like no dialogue mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. narration or introduction. Just sound effects. Just sound effects it was, like animals. It was jarring. Yeah. It takes a bit. Like, there's some inter- interesting parts. Like, I feel like that's interesting from a filmmaking standpoint that's the choice they went with mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh the the middle of the film is mostly forgettable except for that weird scene where they're all screaming for no reason oh w- when they're in the cabin of the alcoholic and like the key floats and then yeah. all of the like the <laughs> oven catches on fire the pipes rupture oh yeah there's that it's a really really stunning scene yeah that i thought was cool when the door breaks open and the fake snow comes in, yeah. not, you know, you know, it's fake because they, you can't see their breath, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. but that, that, that camera angle where like the wind is blowing on them and the, and the snow is coming in and, and it's on the face. That looked really cool. Yeah. No, everything uh, the, in this is kind of visually interesting and entertaining for sure. I, you know, thumbs the, up for me. <laughs> the last 15 minutes is bat shit crazy though. Yeah. And like there, this is a. It felt like somebody was on acid when making this. Oh sure, sure. This 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 was like if you asked a eight year old, hey, you need to write a showdown between kind of a, a a slightly bad guy and a very very bad guy, and one of them gets cosmic powers, and there's a lady there. What happens? And then this eight year old just kind of goes in there and and writes. Well, this is what sounds really cool. And this is, sounds really cool. And I want to see this happen. And the guy's face gets melted off with lasers. <laughs> and that, that's yeah. what it really feels like. And, and you know what? For that, it's great. Like, if you have yeah. a group of friends together, this could be a fun watch. And this one, you know, compare out of the two, this is infinitely more watchable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, like, this is the kind of thing, too, where, like, if your local, like, art house theater decides to do, like, a 3D double feature... I'd consider seeing it in 3D on the big screen with a group of friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have a couple drinks right beforehand. Go in there. You know, maybe some edibles. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, I might have nightmares after that yeah. uh, that death at the end, though. Yeah. Like, it, it's as jarring as, uh, like, as TNG's conspiracy episode. Oh, how that ends, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, you know what I mean? Like, how, how out of place it is. Guy freaking has his head explode and... Yeah, you're just whoa. Wait a, where, when did this happen? Oh. <laughs> pretty much, but yeah. So that's that's pretty much going to do it for these two. A, a pair of weird, interesting releases from Kino. Like, I love that they keep putting out these obscure movies, but uh, I, if I had to pick one, it's definitely Treasure of the Four Crowns to put into my collection. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I'm not going to recommend. I wouldn't recommend either one of them it, it, unless like in special circumstances like the treasure of the four crowns like you said being released in an art house theater to watch it yeah. I mean, absolutely it's amazing if you're a huge fan of italian sword and sorcery style movies sure this is inter- interesting because it is maybe a little more sci-fi adventure it, it's it's a mishmash of a ton of different genres and they tried to piece it all together so it's a, a unique it's a unique vision. I'll give it that. This is a good party film. Like I said, you don't need to be really paying attention to it. You can have it on at a party and not just keep it muted. And every time you you turn back to the TV, something weird and interesting is happening, but you don't need to have attention focused on it. So it's one of those things to have on at a party where you don't want to disrupt conversation. Exactly. Uh, and maybe give it a watch in 3D if you can. Get yeah. a bunch of those oh, sure. 3D glasses. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's probably going to do it for this episode. I mean, there's not much more we can say on these. Uh, I had uh, an interesting time. It's great to be back recording with you again. Yeah. I know we're going to have more in the next couple of weeks that we're uh, we're going to be checking out. Uh, I've got some ideas percolating. We'll see how that goes. Uh, so I guess uh, we're going to be seeing you uh, pretty much every Thursday for more uh, Earth for Soup. I'm not exactly sure which release is coming then because 
I don't know when this episode is coming out directly. Yeah, but and, and Darlene sure and I, uh, we tend to record a little ahead of time as well. Yes, so. we, we, you know, I can say this. There are dozens of episodes coming, <laughs> and they'll all be interesting. So uh, I, I, that comes out every Thursday. Uh, as we sort of wind down for the year, we take our, our December into mid-January hiatus. We're going to have a few episodes recorded, so we have stuff ready to go during that time period. But I think it's going to be great having more uh, more of these Loose Cannon episodes coming in the future. Hopefully more weird, crazy stuff from Kino like this. And this was a canon film, so that, uh, you know it fits perfectly with our Loose Cannon theme. Uh, so I guess uh, we have been uh, Alex the Producer and Aaron. Yeah, and that's, I'm uh, Aaron. Yeah. That's going to be it. And hopefully uh, if you do end up checking these out, you can do so with uh, some friends and uh, a bunch of uh, mind altering substances as long as they're legal. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Are either one of these any good? Sir. What? Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. Quick, change the channel. You're wasting your life making shit. Nobody cares. These movies are terrible. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember... And surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.